My guest at this time will battle Daniel Garcia on Friday, May 7th, live on IWTV for the Limitless Wrestling Championship. You probably saw him battling Darby Allen live on AEW uh, Dynamite recently for the TNT Championship. It is J.D. Drake. J.D., thank you very much for taking the time to chat with me here today. Yes, sir, no problem. Thank you for having me on. And um, just please disregard me being in my car. As busy as I am, this is the place I get the most privacy, honestly. <laughs> well, hey, don't worry about it, brother. I do a lot of I do a lot of interviews with people in their cars. I totally understand it. Um, yeah, well, it's perfect. Well, J.D., um, before we get into all this stuff, the Limitless, the AEW, or AEW, I mean, tell me a little bit about yourself, J.D. Like, what's your little, briefly, what's your backstory? What brought you to the, the wacky world of professional wrestling? Well, I've been a professional wrestling fan since, God, as long as I can remember, probably three, four years old. Probably the same story you've heard from a lot of other people. Um, I grew up loving Hulk Hogan, of course, blah, blah, blah. But the more that I started to understand about professional wrestling, the more I started to gravitate towards the likes of Arn Anderson and the Great Muda. Yeah, it was something me and my grandmother actually uh, actually took interest in. She showed it to me a long, long, long time ago. She figured if I was going to watch it, she was going to watch it with me so that she could kind of censor what I saw. Blah blah blah, bullshit. But anyway, um, I got into professional wrestling through a friend of mine in high school. He started out as a backyarder, and he found actual professional wrestling when his backyard company got shut down he got trained and when i got out of school he hit me up and said hey do you still want to train i said well yeah but i've got to hide it from my parents or else my mother will kill me so that's what happened i uh, went out i uh, took a few bumps trained for about a month under them and they threw me into my first match which went well and the guy i wrestled in my first match was david reimer his gimmick name was wicked and after that, he actually pulled me to the side and said, hey, man, would you like to actually get trained? We lost Hold on a second. We lost your video. Oh, nah, I did because somebody is calling me. Mm -hmm. Fix okay. that right fast. You're good. All right, I'm back. Um, so he pulled me to the side and said, you actually want to be trained? And I said, yeah, I do. So he finished, like, or took me on the road, showed me the business. Uh, my first actual bumps before I got out of high school was under George South who bumped me in a uh, <laughs> in a little auction house in Vail, North Carolina and beat the piss out of me. I'm talking, I took 150 bumps that day. Sorry, we lost and, you. Sorry, there you go. Yeah, I've got people blowing me up. <laughs> I don't like it. Okay, sorry, go ahead. But I'm back. Look, don't cut none of this because this is my life. You wanted my life, this is my life. Um, so, George South finished my training. He started me by t giving me my first box in the auction house in Vail when I was 17 years old. He finished me by saying, hey, kid, this is how you work. So, the last 20 years have basically just been me uh, bouncing around from indie company to indie company trying to make a name for myself. In the last four years, it's finally paid off. Man, yeah, dude, I was looking at your resume. You have worked a lot of places, JD. I mean, I've been all over the place. Man, it is really, and I, I mean, it's really, it, it's really incredible, man, to like see you now on national TV. I mean, it's, it, AEW has given a, uh, a birth to so many talents like yourself. I look at Eddie Kingston kind of similarly as well. Right. I know you mentioned uh, Arn Anderson um, as somebody that you you grew up idolizing. What it, what was it like for right. you? What was it like for you to, to show up at AEW and actually like get to, you know, meet this guy? I don't know. Did he have any input on, on any of the work you've been doing or, or anything like that? Well, he had he had heard of me through the grapevine. He had not really seen much of my work, but he knew who I was. And we sat down and we talked for about 30, 45 minutes about everything other than wrestling. <laughs> about life, about sports, um, you name it, we talked about it. And then he said, I like your look, kid. I was like, well, I appreciate it. Does it look familiar? And he just smirked and walked away. <laughs> and his son, Brock, happened to be sitting there, too, which was even more hilarious. Brock looked at me and said, yeah. <laughs> and that was about it. But, um, yeah, Arn has been a – he's just been a pleasure to sit down and talk to anytime I'm down there, man. It's, you can't get enough being under his learning tree him or Jake Roberts or Sting or any of them. Anybody that's down there that speaks, Big Show, any of them, if they speak, you listen. And if you do anything other than listen, you're doing it wrong. 
Yeah, man. Uh, well, uh, we can talk some more AEW stuff here in just a second. Uh, I want to start off by talking about uh, this big match you've got here against uh, new Limitless Wrestling champion uh, Daniel Garcia. Um, you know, you talk about it. 20 years in the business. You're finally getting some big opportunities. What does it mean for you? What is your headspace like uh, walking into this title opportunity with, with Daniel Garcia? I don't roll my eyes or any of that because we're talking about the match with Garcia. I roll my eyes at the sheer mention of Daniel Garcia. He has so much talent, and he's just – it's unreal how talented he is for such a young age. Um, there was another guy that I uh, ran into that way, super cocky, ultra-talented, stupid young, all the potential in the world. Uh, you can see him on WWE television now, Austin Theory. So, Daniel Garcia has got a lot of the same traits. I mean, great shape, unreal technical wrestler. But, man, I, there's something about him I can't wrap my head around. Like, you preach that you love professional wrestling, you love the sport, your competitive nature is this and that, but you're not the most honorable human being when you're in the ring. Like, he knows he tapped out the Lee Moriarty. He knows he did. That's who I should be wrestling at the games we play, is Lee Moriarty. You know it, I know it, anybody that watched the video knows it. But he takes advantage of a situation. He's opportunistic. I can't say that I wouldn't have done the same thing, but I can say that I probably wouldn't have done the same thing. I probably would have just admitted, hey, man, I tapped. That's it. Or oh, to be honest, I wouldn't have tapped. I'd have had to pass out first. It had to break my arm or I'd have had to pass out or something. So at the games we play, coming up at Limitless, sportsmanship's out the window. I'm beating the piss out of Daniel Garcia. I'm going to out-wrestle him, I'm going to out-fight him, I'm going to outlast him, and I'm going to make his ass tap like the bitch he is. Um, and so with that, not just wanting to embarrass Daniel Garcia, I mean, taking— That's not embarrassing. That's telling the truth. Well, you called him a bitch, you know. I, mean, I did. Yeah, you know, so, and you said you want to make him tap. That sounds like yes. that sounds like you're trying to embarrass him when you when you kind of put it in those terms. That's why I say that, you know. Teach a lesson. Okay, teach a lesson. Well, on the path to teaching your lesson, um, you could walk away with this title as well. And, you know, the Limitless Wrestling Championship, uh, I know, is a title that's really been a gateway for a lot of guys to go on to bigger things. Do you, do you view right. the title kind of in that same light or no? Oh, of course. Of course. It's a championship I've been after ever since I started, like, my actual singles run in independent wrestling. Um, everybody knows I've been at Limitless Wrestling for a long time, alongside tag partner Anthony Henry as a part of the best tag team in professional wrestling, the Workhorse. That's no secret. So when Anthony moved on, I was left to make a singles run, and I immediately set my eyes on the Limitless Wrestling Heavyweight Championship. Um, I've got a long history of singles gold already under my belt, the longest reigning WWN champion in the history of the company. I've held singles championships all over America. It's like I've held gold all over America, tag team or otherwise. It's just, this is, to me, this is a way to solidify a run, to solidify a career that I feel like is just taking off. So if it solidifies now and continues taking off, imagine how much better it's going to be. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, Evolve Tag Champion, I know as well, right? Um, in our debut. Yeah, I mean, y you have, J.D. You you've done so many things. And, like, again, you know, going back to the, you know, 20 years in this business, uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about as well is, you know, how, how was it for you starting to really see some success, or you say, like, in the last four years or so, right in the midst of that, I mean, you go from 100 to zero with the pandemic, like, mentally, physically, how, is that how did that affect you here, I guess, the last year or so since this has all been going on? Well, man, that's tough. It's to, I really thought, like, I was just hitting my stride. Evolve was about to do some really big things. Yeah. Anthony and myself was about to do some really big things. And then just, I had like eight or nine bookings on, on many a week that week, right before it shut down. And then wrestling's gone. And everything I've worked so hard for, I've put, at the time, I put forth 18, 19 years into a business. I poured my blood, my sweat, my tears, my heart, everything into it. And then for this to just take it away. I really thought I was done. Really thought I was done. I thought that I may as well sell my stuff, 
get back into all of the old hobbies I had and call it a career. Little did I know that the pandemic would be where my career would be reborn. Right. Coming out of the pandemic, there were some companies that asked me to come along and and uh, wrestle some of their guys to get them back acquainted with professional wrestling. And I did. And I started training at high spots as far as running a training class on Thursdays. So getting to have my hand in the development of young talent really started to turn the volume dial up on my love again for professional wrestling. Then I started seeing that I wasn't moving around like the same old Drake that I was. I was moving better. My body had a chance to heal. My mind had a chance to heal. People don't understand when you're on the road all the time, when you're on the road four out of seven days a week and you're traveling from city to city, a lot of times spending more time on an airplane than you do your own bed. It takes a toll on you. Mm-hmm. The traveling takes a bigger toll than wrestling does. You don't have a t- you don't have a chance to slow down, recover, rehab, any of that. So that gave me about a year to actually get myself together. And I did some soul searching. I went and found who I was again. And when I came back to wrestling, I was having fun again. And when I started having fun, I started pouring more into it. Like I, I didn't think I had any more. Yeah. And then I went, I went down for an opportunity in Orlando that didn't come to pass, which has led me to where I am now because it really lit a fire under my ass because Spite is a hell of a motivator. Yeah, because, you know, you talk about, uh, you know, how everything was starting to kind of peak just before the pandemic. You know, a lot of people know you from Dynamite and AEW Dark. Um, but just before the pandemic, like you talk about the Evolve relationship, you were just on NXT, like very shortly before everything kind of went to hell, right? In February of 2019? Yeah. Yeah, or no, it was 2020. 20, it was 2020. February of 2020. Yeah, yeah, I was about to say, yeah. February of 2020, I went down to the PC for a week. I trained for a week down there with the relationship with Evolve. I wrestled Dio Madden on a house show and defeated Dio Madden. I was supposed to wrestle Ridge Holland the next day, but I got hurt during my match with Dio Madden. Um, my lower back, like I hurt my lower left facet joint, and I couldn't stand up straight. It was it was the worst. But there were there were talks then. They were interested, and I mean that opportunity fell through. And everything happens for a reason. I'm starting to really believe that now more than ever because I've been blessed with opportunities that I wouldn't have gotten otherwise, like this match with Daniel Garcia. I get an opportunity to not only win one of the most prestigious championships in America in singles wrestling, but I have an opportunity to teach a young kid that sometimes his mouth is going to overload his ass, and he needs to be thankful that he has the opportunities that he has and not take advantage of them. I get such hardcore Matty Winchester or bruiser or the beer city bruiser vibes off you and like the best. I, it's odd. That, that's my cousin. I love him so much. I didn't know you guys were cousins. That's wild. Oh. We didn't either. Oh man. Okay. I'd like to slam some beers with you guys sometime. Uh, <laughs> A lot of them. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. That's fine. I know Matty. Um, so how did your AEW debut come about in February then, man? Almost a year, like a year to the almost day you, you were in NXT and then all of a sudden now you're, you're here in AEW doing dark. How did that come about? All right, funny story. Um, I'm actually in Myrtle Beach, South Carolina, playing in a slow pitch softball tournament. Oh, cool. Was <laughs> Saint Sid there or no? Uh, no, he was not. I was down. Um, I was actually in bed that night. It was about 1.30 in the morning. I wake up, check my phone, and I have a text. Hey, are you available to do AEW? I was like, yes, <laughs> absolutely I am. I had sent an email in November, maybe maybe October, just sending my resume in. And I got a text message because I'd left my telephone number and email asking me if I was available. I told them yes. They said, good, we'll see you next Wednesday. And they sent me all of my information. I got down there. And when I walk in, they give me my itinerary for everything I'm going to be doing. I see my name next to Eddie Kingston on dark. I'm like, uh, all right, this will be fun. This is not the first time we've done this dance. Me and Eddie haven't wrestled but about eight times already. Yeah. And we've beat the piss out of each other every time. Mm-hmm. Then the next night I have uh, Stu Grayson. I had no clue what was going on when I walked in down there. I get Eddie Kingston and Stu Grayson in my first two matches in AEW. You want to talk about excited? Whew. I was thoroughly excited. Oh. 
And I must have impressed because I've been back ever since. Yeah, man. Uh, I was going to ask. So, like, what's your do? You, so you come in, you impress. You're getting called back. Tony Khan and Cody have talked about like this tiered deal system. Are you on any kind of deal right now, or is this still one of those things where you're kind of looking to see exactly where this is going to go? They keep bringing me down. That's all I know. Okay, cool. Uh, have that's, you ever- literally, that's literally it. I'm not kayfabing anybody. I don't know anything. I know that I'm going down. I'm impressing. I'm doing my job. I'm hanging out with my boys, Peter Avalon and Ryan Nimitz and Cesar Bononi, who I became friends with my first trip to the PC back in February. So how wild that me and him are hanging out a lot when I go down there. Uh, have you had a chance to talk to Tony about your work? Uh, have you got any feedback from the boss up top or no? Um, Tony has had nothing but positive things to say to me and about me when I've been down there. Nice. Yeah. Uh, so, no arguments there. Okay, cool. So, so obviously you go from, you know, you have a couple dark matches here. You tag with Ryan, a friend of yours, you say at one point, And then shortly after that, all of a sudden you're going to be on AEW Dynamite and you're going to be taking mm-hmm. on Darby Allen for the TNT Championship. Walk me through uh, kind of how, how that came about and what was the experience like of of battling for this prestigious title on, on, on national television against a, a star like Darby Allen right now. So Tony comes up to me and says, Hey man, um, your work has been, your work has been really solid since you've been here. You're wrestling Darby Allen next week for the TNT championship. Get ready. And I kind of looked at him and I said, I stay ready. Okay. This works. So I come home, I uh, rack my brain as to what the hell just happened, and I start preparing. And then we shoot the Road 2 video package, and I lay everything out on the line. Everything in that package is like, that's genuine from the heart, 110%. If you want to know what J.D. Drake is, go to YouTube, look up Road Road to Dynamite between me and Darby Allen. You'll get to see me pull the curtain completely back and you'll get to see the insides of what makes me tick i get there on that wednesday and the environment's just insane everybody's coming up to me talking asking me if i'm ready and all that good stuff and i'm trying my best to treat it like just another day but the intensity is so it's it's so big just inside my chest inside my head that people can't help but tell that i'm a different human that day And I had every intention of going out there and not just stealing a professional wrestling event. No, none of that. I went out there to win a championship to prove to people who've always told me you're too this, you're too, you're too white, you're too fat, you're too redneck, you've got too much gray hair, you're too old, you're too broken down. I went out there to prove everybody wrong. That's what I've done my entire career. And damn it, I did. Yeah. I'm not going to say I feel like I did. I did. I, I, it was a great, it was a great match. It really was. You and Darby work really well together, especially with the size difference. I thought you guys were able to do a lot of things. You know, as much as people really liked uh, Darby and Jungle Boy, which was which was a great TNT, TNT title match as well. Just a very different kind of dynamic. Uh, it has he has when he's working with somebody with your size, where he can maybe throw himself around a little bit more. I guess if that if that makes sense. Darby is an extremely tough competitor for anybody of like of any kind of size. Like if you're a bigger dude. Darby is at home. If you don't believe me, go back and look at some of his some of his other work. I've seen him beat guys my size even bigger. And that's normally where he's most effective. How? I have no clue. I don't know. And his coffin drop from the top felt like a fucking 600-pound elephant fell on me. That sucked. Yeah. My back cracked from the crack, like the top of my butt crack all the way to the base of my neck. It was terrible. But Darby is a hell of an he's a hell of a competitor. It don't matter what situation you put him in. Yeah. He's there for a reason. Yeah. Um well JD uh as much as I uh, everybody knows you uh from Limitless or NXT or AW Dynamite, uh my girlfriend only knows you uh from Effie's Big Gay Brunch. Uh, oh my god. <laughs> which we which which I got her to watch she doesn't watch wrestling with me, but I was like you right. might you might like this. This seems like something more your style, and uh, she loved it. She loved you. A uh, very different dynamic. What was it like for you to to work uh, at Effie's Big Gay Brunch? How was that experience for you? 
it was no different than wrestling any other show because I'm on shows with a lot of the same guys that was there, guys and girls. Yeah. I'm on shows with them all over the place. And I mean, that show was, it was about highlighting the LGBTQ community, but just celebrate wrestling. Cause that's what it was. It was great wrestling. It was. I mean, I'm one of the biggest allies when it comes to that side of life that there are period. Yeah. Like I've got people in my family, um, a sister, a cousin, multiple cousins that that's just, that's the way they choose to live life. And I'm, I take up for everybody that's a part of it. And for me to be able to compete on that event, it really did mean a lot. And the match with MV was a lot of fun. He's very good, probably underrated in a lot of people's eyes. Um, Great human as well. Um, But it was, it was a lot of fun. But to me, the atmosphere in the back was no different than any other wrestling show that I've been on. You got to you got to get the the Pero deal. I got to watch you squash Twinks all day. You know, you don't want to be buried in Twinks? No, you don't want the you yeah, don't... freaking Pero. <laughs> I had to be his idea. It had to be. I, there's nobody else on the planet that would have come up with that. I know Odinson didn't come up with it, although he enjoyed beating the hell out of people. Yeah. I know he enjoyed beating the hell out of people. I have I, I like a pig in shit. I don't know that I've ever seen anybody as happy as Odin uh, throwing those tiny little twinks around. It was really enjoyable to watch. You know, he was having a blast. <laughs> Fun fact: Pero's husband Morgan loves me more than he loves Pero, and I hope Pero sees this and it's the truth. He knows. Uh, JD, uh, obviously the Limitless Championship is on your mind right now. You're it really, really is. Yes. You are you are finding a groove at the moment. There are you are gaining supporters. It seems uh, every day at this point. Where do you want to go? What like what goals? I mean, you're at a point now. I know where you have a little bit more perspective on the business. So like, what it is? What is it that you you still want to accomplish? Like, what in your mind are the next steps and things you want to do? Well, anybody who's ever watched any promo of mine or anything where it comes to me talking about my goals and what I want to accomplish. You've heard this before. So, I mean, skip ahead if you don't want to hear it again. But I want to create a life for myself, my family, my children that they didn't have. I want to cement a legacy that they can look back at and say, that's my dad and I'm proud of him. So if that means walking into the games we play and beating Daniel Garcia, taking that championship and defending it all over, not just America, but the world, then that's what I'm going to do. If it means walking in there and slapping the taste out of some kid's mouth and teaching him that, hey, this is not how you conduct yourself as a champion. And I beat respect into him. And for some reason, I don't win. But he leaves that match understanding that you treat people with respect if you want respect. Then I've done my job. I just want to be the type of person, the type of man, husband, father, champion that everybody can respect. That's all. Fair enough. Uh, JD, where do you want to send people to find you, follow you, support you, uh, all those great things? All over Facebook. Uh, you find me, James D. Drake, on Facebook, at Real JD Drake on Twitter, at Real James Drake on Instagram, uh, on TikTok, at Real JD Drake. Um, you might be able to find me at your local slow pitch softball event. You never know. Might be able to find me at your local bowling alley, bowling and drinking beer. Maybe at Matty Winchester's house drinking beer. Uh, I'd like to go hang out with Ashley more than I would Matt because Ashley seems like she wears the pants in the family. Um, but yeah, that's about it. And you can always find me on AEW Dark, AEW Elevation. Um, hopefully, Dynamite again here soon. But the wingmen, the wingmen are making waves there. And I'm going to make waves in Maine at Limitless Wrestling by beating the absolute piss out of Daniel Garcia. 